Hi everyone, welcome to lecture four. So today we'll talk about threats to validity, which is, you know, what can go wrong in a field experiment, and um, a method for data analysis called instrumental variables. So we're going to have three units. The first unit is the threats to validity, where we'll define non-compliance, different kinds of non-compliance when you run a field experiment. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about the design and analysis, uh, essentially to deal with the non-compliance problem. Uh, we'll use the idea of instrumental variables um, to deal with non-compliance. And lastly, we're going to use an example of a field experiment where we encountered non-compliance and we used instrumental variable regressions. Um, and so that's the I et al. paper. So let's go through the first topic, which is threats to validity. And essentially, all sorts of things can go wrong when you run an experiment. So for non-compliance, we differentiate between one-sided versus two-sided uh, non-compliance. Uh, we might also have attrition or spillovers or evaluation-driven effects. So lots of these effects are very intuitive. And we're just going to go through them one by one. Uh, hopefully, when you design experiments and analyze experiments, you remember these uh, threats to validity. So let's take a look at the non-compliance or failure to treat issue. Uh, the one that's often encountered uh, by experimenters when you work in the field is one-sided non-compliance. Sometimes it's called the failure to treat. That occurs when some of the subjects assigned to the treatment group do not actually receive the treatment. Uh, an old uh, example is when you send out, let's say, fundraising letters. Um, and you know these letters contain some, some of them have the treatment version, some of them have the control version inside the envelope. Uh, your potential subjects receive the envelope, and they didn't even open it, so they just toss it into the trash. Well, then they're not treated because they did not read um, what you intend them to read. Uh, the other type of noncompliance is called two-sided noncompliance. This occurs when some subjects in the assigned treatment group go untreated, and some subjects in the assigned control group actually receive the treatment. Um, so we'll go through examples of both, but let's go ahead and define uh, assigned versus actual treatment. Sometimes it's also called intent to treat for assigned treatment, and actual treatment is called treated. So we're going to use the same set of notations that we've always used. So we're going to uh, let the experimental assignment of subject i be denoted as zi. So zi is an indicator variable. When zi equals 1, the subject is assigned to the treatment group. And when zi equals 0, the subject is assigned to the control group. So in the previous lectures, we say that di equals zi. Remember, we use di to indicate treated versus controlled subjects. So basically, that assumes that all subjects assigned to the treatment group are treated. In other words, when you send out the letters, everybody actually opened the letter and read it. And also, we assume that no subjects assigned to the control group are treated. So the, the household that received your letter who's assigned to the control group actually just read the treatment letter. In other words, they don't wander into their neighbor's house and say, oh, you received the same letter. Let me read your letter. Um, if the neighbor happened to be in the treatment group, then the subject in the control group will be contaminated. So we assume that whatever you assign them to, they stay in that group. Uh, now we add some reality to our setup. So now we're going to use DIZ to represent whether subject I actually is treated when the treatment assignment is Z. So if a subject would be treated if assigned to the treatment group, then we say DI as a function of Z equals 1, which means that the subject is assigned to the treatment group. 
and then we can simplify that as di of 1 equals 1. So if a subject is assigned to the treatment group, this subject is actually treated. So using this notation, we can also capture the situation where a subject is assigned to the treatment group but did not receive treatment. So this, in this case, we use di of 1 equals 0, or in other words, di of z equals 1 equals 0. So this is the case when you send out a letter, a treatment letter, and the subject actually just tossed it into the trash. Um, or you send out an email and the subject actually did not open the email. So that's the, uh, the situation why a treatment subject actually did not receive treatment. So that's uh, our notation. So now we're going to define two types of subjects which will be important in the understanding of the instrumental variable unit. So. Um, we look at subjects in the experiment with one-sided non-compliance, and we can divide them into basically two latent groups. They're called compliers and never-takers. So this is the case when sometimes the subjects assigned to the treatment group actually did not receive treatment. So who are compliers? Compliers meet two conditions. Uh, that is, if they're assigned to a treatment group, they actually receive the treatment. In other words, di of 1 assigned to treatment equals 1. Um, and they do not receive the treatment if they're assigned to the control group. In other words, di of 0 equals 0. So these are your ideal subjects. They never actually deviates to the other group. The never takers are the one who never take the treatment regardless of whether they're assigned to the treatment group or the control group. So these are di of 1 equals 0. So if you assign them to, to the treatment, they are not treated. And uh, di of 0 equals 0. If you assign them to the control group, um, they're not treated. Um, so if you are thinking of the control group as the people you don't touch, um, so when you send out letters, a subset of your subjects, a random subset of your subjects, do not receive letters. These are people who receive the letters but don't read them. And if they are assigned to the control group, you know, by definition of your design, they don't read the letter. So they don't actually receive the letter. Uh, so these are the two types. So a big question we have is how would we estimate the average treatment effect with noncompliance? The wrong approach, which actually is often seen in, pub in the published literature, um, is you just ignore the compliance issue. You compare the compliers to the control condition. That is, when the treatment group consists of compliers and never takers, what you have is you, know, you observe the compliers, but you actually don't observe the never takers' actions. And so the wrong approach is we ignore the fact that some people actually toss their letters or don't open their emails. Um, they're never treated. And we just look at those who are treated and compare them to the control group. Um, that would cause biased estimates for the average treatment effects. So one way to fix this you know, we can think of that as, you know, the optimal design option under low rates of compliance is to deploy two versions of the treatment, one with the active ingredient and the other one that functions merely as a placebo. When you look at those who actually receive the treatment or uh, the placebo, you can uh, compare the treated and the untreated compliers. So in the, in the third part, when we talk about applications in the I et al. paper 2016 experiment, um, we created a placebo group where everybody in the treatment and the placebo group receive an email. So uh, telling them you know, that there are existence of lending teams but the treatment group also received team recommendations, which is the treatment in this experiment, whereas uh, the placebo group only received the email. 
but do not receive information or recommendation of teams. So that's one way of, of handling the non-compliance issue. And we'll go into more detail uh, when we move to the third unit. Now I'm going to go through a number of commonly observed issues with implementation of field experiment. And the first type is the spillover effects. So the spillover effect is an indirect effect of a program on subjects who are not being treated by the experiment. So for example, uh, we in the previous lectures, we talked about uh, the level of randomization. We know that clustering reduces power, but sometimes you have to cluster to avoid the spillover effect. So for instance, uh, when you want to evaluate whether school lunch improves student learning outcomes, you can randomize at the school level or you can randomize at the individual student level. But if you do randomize at the individual student level, then uh, it's very easy to actually get the spillover effect. So for instance, there are two friends. One is treated and therefore gets you know, free school lunch. The other one is not treated um, and might not have brought lunch with her. Then the treated friend decided that she wants to share her lunch with her friend. Um, and if they do this on a regular basis, your control students will also be treated, will also have spillovers uh, of the treatment. So this is one of the main reasons that we want to actually cluster in our random assignment. There are also a number of well-known effects. They're called the evaluation-driven effects. So uh, we're going to go through them one by one. Um, the first one is called the Horthon effects. So this refers to a situation, you know, in the 1920s, uh, there was an illumination experiment conducted at Western Electric's Hawthorne plant near Chicago in the 1920s. Um, so the idea behind the experiment is that they will change the lighting situation in the factory and look at how that lighting situation changes productivity. However, the treatment group is aware of being selected and they feel special of being in the treatment group. Therefore, they work extra hard during the observation period. So they actually, you know, even when the experimenters change the lighting to the original status quo, you still get this increased productivity. And so this is the situation where the uh, participants knew that they were being treated and they actually changed their behavior as a result of being selected. So how would you reduce the Horthon effect? One way to do that is to make the treatment as um, discreet as possible so that if, if possible, you do not reveal that you are actually conducting an experiment. Another effect that's fairly well known is called the John Henry effect, which is the situation where a control participant is aware of their status as members of the control group and is able to compare their performance with that of a treatment group. So they might actually work harder to overcome the disadvantage of being in the control group that would attenuate your treatment effect. And it's called the John Henry effect because uh, John Henry was a legendary American steel driver. Um, his output at the time was being compared to that of a steam drill. Uh, when he knew that, he worked so hard to outperform the machine that he died in the process. Um, so that, that's why um, this is called the John Henry effect. Again, when you reveal that a participant is in an experiment, is in a field experiment, when they are aware, they're in, either in the treatment or the control group, they might change their behavior. There's another effect which is fairly prevalent. It's called the experimental demand effect. And the uh, often cited example is the Stanford Prison Experiment. So this is the case when Dr. Philip Zimbardo, a social psychologist at Stanford at the time, uh, put participants into, you know, they ran, he randomized the participants into two roles, the prisoners or the guards. So 
During the experiment, the participants change their behavior to fit what they believe the experimenter is trying to test. So this is when uh, subjects anticipate or trying to guess what the experimenter is trying to test and change their behavior to conform to the experimenters, their expectation of the experimenter's demand. So in this particular experiment, both sides took their roles far too seriously and conformed to the stereotype of you know, prison guards versus prisoners. Uh, the experiment had to be cut short after only six days. So uh, another criticism of the Stanford prison experiment is that it's a demonstration rather than a well-designed experiment. That aside, experimental demand effect is actually prevalent in both lab and field experiments. So for instance, in a lab experiment, if you as the experimenter walk around the lab and watch what each subject um, is doing, and perhaps even uh, give signals of approval or disapproval, that would influence the results of the experiment. So that's called the experimental demand effect. Another effect is called the anticipation effect. Um, you might recall that sometimes we have the face-in design. So in the Uber tipping experiment, half of the drivers uh, receive the tipping function in their app you know, about 10 days before the other half. When you run these experiments, when the comparison group or the control group change their behavior because they think they'll receive the program in the future. So let's say that the control drivers knew that in 10 days they will also receive the treatment. What they might be doing is you know, perhaps improve their service to the customers, anticipating that you know, they might receive tipping very soon. That would change the difference between the treatment and the control. Um, sometimes there's not much you can do. So in the, in the Uber tipping experiment, for example, um, the company actually had announced to the entire population uh, of drivers that this is a new feature that they're going to push out, but they, they're going to face in um, the, the feature, pushing out of the feature. Uh, so this is uh, Mohammed Yunus, who was the managing director of Grameen Bank, who piloted the group lending and microfinance programs in Bangladesh. Um, so in lots of development experiments, we also have used the facing design, which is you know, a fraction of the villagers would receive a treatment or a program uh, before the other, the other half. Um, and in that case, if they anticipate that they're going to be treated, they might be changing their behavior before the treatment starts. Um, so that's something to be aware of when you design an experiment, and when you, especially when you release information about the timing of the treatments. Another effect um, is called the survey effect. This is particularly worrisome when you try to combine a survey together with an experiment. Generically, this is a very good idea. But sometimes people might change their behavior just as a result of being surveyed. So a well-known example is a method used in social psychology called priming. So for instance, if you use a set of questionnaires, if that somehow prime the participants' gender identity, for instance, they might change their behavior subsequently in the experiment to conform with gender stereotypes. The same is true with, um, we know, effects on ethnicity and so on. So subsequent measures of performance might, might have changed because of the survey. So if the survey has to be conducted before an experiment, assuming that the experiment is what you're primarily interested in, a good practice is always to conduct the survey after the experiment so you do not contaminate uh, or change people's behavior for the main part of your study. If you have to conduct the survey before the experiment, then be aware of the survey effects and make sure that your questionnaires do not have or try to minimize the likelihood that people's behavior might have changed as a result of taking the survey. 
So here is a summary of the effects that we talked about. So we looked at uh, the uh, evaluation-driven effects. Sometimes people perform better or do better. Um, if this happens in the treatment group, then we call it the Horthon effects. If the control group subjects are motivated to do better, that's called the John Henry effect. Something else that is really important, uh, regardless of whether you conduct the lab exp a lab experiment or a field experiment, is the experimental demand effect, which is, you know, this is something that you want to minimize. That refers to the situation where subjects try to anticipate what the experimenter want them to do and change their behavior in conformity to their expectations. Uh, when you conduct a face-in design uh, in your experiment, uh, if subjects anticipate that they will be receiving treatment soon, they might change their, their behavior before the treatment even started. So that's called the anticipation effect. And lastly, you know, a survey might affect what people do. Uh, and that could affect the treatment group or the control group subjects. Here, again, a good uh, practice is to always conduct the survey after the experiment, if that's possible. If you have to conduct the survey before the experiment, you know, think about the survey effect and think about wordings that try to minimize the survey effect.